sea levels are rising, putting Massachusetts coastal communities at risk. That's according to a recently unveiled climate action plan from Governor Healy's administration, which estimates that if global warming doesn't slow down, the state's 1,500 miles of shoreline will suffer $1 billion in damages annually by 2070. So what will all of this look like, and what can we do about it? I'm joined by Spencer Glendon, the founder of Probable Futures, a nonprofit that works to make practical climate science information, tools, and resources available to everyone. Spencer, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Gotham. So, Spencer, we hear a lot about climate change. Can you help us put into sort of larger perspective what that really means? Sure. The, the reason we talk about climate change is actually because the climate didn't change for 12,000 years. So civilization, which is living in settled places, building for the long term, specializing, doing agriculture, was basically built on a stable climate because if you knew what the past was, you could plan for the future. Climate change is now taking us out of that long stability. And with that long stability came these patterns. So the long historical answer is for 12,000 years, the climate stayed in a very narrow range of plus or minus roughly one degree. And the reason things are getting funky now is because we're about a one and a half degree above that long-term average outside the range of really human experience, but also moving. So I think one and a half degrees, it's hard for people to get their, get their head around what that means. So for Massachusetts, what yeah. does a one and a half degree change in global, te in global temperatures mean for us? Well, so you started by talking about the sea level rise. And I think that's the easiest thing to imagine. And I do think it's a good place to start because, you know, the, the water, the oceans are big and aqueous. They shouldn't stay still. Like, we don't think of water as being inert. But yet we counted on that coast being just in one place. But I actually think the emphasis on sea level rise is the, maybe the least important problem for, the, for now and for 1.5 degrees because what's already happened is the ranges of temperatures have changed, even just where we live. So I'm going to talk about two things today that I think could be helpful to illustrate this. They may not be as headline grabbing. They are sleep and fruit. And so sleep, we need to cool down at night to sleep well. And because the sun goes away, that usually happens. But nights are getting hot faster than days are. There are more record hot nights than days. And the range of temperatures is uh, moving up. What that means is nights that are sometimes called tropical nights. So in this latitude, it's nights that don't drop below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Used to be pretty rare. Maybe you had a week of it. In a cool year, you might not have any. In a hot year, you'd have maybe three weeks of it. Are now becoming more and more common. Okay, so, I mean, we saw in Phoenix where you had three or four weeks in a row of over 100, 120, even 130 degree temperatures. Yeah. That's not going to happen in Boston, I assume, in the near future. So what does it mean for us that it's 68, over 68? Yeah. So it means that people aren't sleeping as well. It also means people are going to start demanding HVAC equipment, going to have air conditioning when they didn't used to. It's really hard on kids. Um, and so what's happening is even those hot summer nights now are school nights also. So if you look at what happened the first, year, first day of school this year in Massachusetts, lots of kids were sent home because it was too hot in school, in the schools that were not built for air conditioning, were not built for this temperature. So it's not Phoenix, but we didn't build for Phoenix. And so that's one thing. And then the second thing is if you take, we'll go to fruit, in the center of Massachusetts, there are all these orchards. Well, all of those trees were trained, were su suited to the past climate. And one of the things they need is a strong signal that winter has come and gone. Cold, hard freezes that last and then give yield to warmer nights, warmer days. Well, this year there were no stone fruits in Massachusetts, no peaches, no apricots, no plums, because the trees were all tricked by cold weather being followed by very, very warm winter days that caused them to think spring had come, which made them unable to produce fruit later. So I just want to double down on that. In the state of Massachusetts, essentially every crop that depended on stone fruits, on peaches and plums, failed. Yes. Without exception. Essentially without exception. And we should expect that to be routine going forward. Yes. So what does that mean for the state? So if you look at what other crop, what happened with other crops is rainfall precipitation used to be, you know, Massachusetts has a wide range, but there were hot years and wet years and dry years and cold years. Those hots and wets and dries are all getting more extreme, which makes it harder and harder to practice agriculture. And you might think, well, it's fine. I'll still buy strawberries at Shaw's. Except strawberries are grown in California. And the California strawberries, they are irrigated by snowmelt. 
And so actually, the Massachusetts grocery experience in the wintertime, which we're now in, is actually governed by snow melt in California. If it snows in the mountains above the Sacramento Valley, and then that snow melts gradually over the course of the summer and spring and fall, we get strawberries. That's breaking down also. Fewer cold, reliable winters is changing the production of fruit everywhere. Okay, so if we're going to see more droughts, what does that look like? Even if we're not going to see more droughts in Massachusetts, and maybe we will, what, do, what does more droughts look like on a global scale? So drought is a fascinating concept. Drought is an unlikely thing. It's a thing that if you define a severe drought as something that happens sort of once in a generation, as a 5% chance. Just going from the climate of the late 20th century to now is a transition from drought being locally defined as rare to in lots of places what was that rare drought being something that happens every few years. That's not really a drought anymore. It's actually aridification. It's the different climate. So if you think about what's happening where lots of these fires are in the world, it's partly because those trees are the wrong trees for the climate that they're in. It's drier and hotter. And drought is not just a function of a lack of precipitation. Every one degree centigrade or 1.8 degree Fahrenheit warmer that the atmosphere gets, it gets thirstier. It pulls 7% more moisture. So air that is 10 degrees warmer centigrade can hold 100% more moisture, which means it dries out the earth and the, and the plants more. Why does this matter? Well, one of the places that's drying the fastest is the Amazon. And the Amazon rainforest is sort of the lungs of the planet. And as it gets hotter, it gets drier. And it can hold less carbon. It can act less well as this place that is our lungs. And it is actually more inclined to burn. So even these very distant changes, and the last thing, I know you're an expert in political science, one of the best predictors of social unrest and migration is, is drought in agricultural communities. And there are lots of places where drought is becoming so frequent that it's just not viable to be a farmer. So you're seeing the frequency, the global frequency of extreme drought go up, I mean, significantly. In yes. In sense of, if I'm understanding you correctly, human history has not seen anything that looks like that. And there are lots of parts of the world that are going to have to change essentially everything that they do. In the United States, what are the parts of the United States that you see would be mo most affected by these kinds of changes? So the, probably the biggest changes in the United States are going to be from in the in the near term, are three climates. One is very sensitive sort of Mediterranean climates, which are places that are dry but not too dry, or have historically been dry but not too dry, and warm but not too warm. Those are in California and, and mostly along the West Coast and the Southwest, where it was between a desert and an ocean, and it was sort of that just right. But it's so narrow, that climate, that tipping into a desert or tipping from the four, the Mediterranean forest to a grassland is underway. The second is where heat and humidity are really becoming intense. In the south and then in, uh, in Florida and the southeast, where the combination of heat and humidity is already leading to much higher kidney disease and things because the body has to work so much hard. We're big mammals. We need to offload heat, and the air needs to take it from us. That warmer, more moist air is just not, our, not friendly to us. And that's a global phenomenon as well as a local phenomenon. And then the last is places where we built very, very complex systems like Boston. We built all of this infrastructure you can see in the back, like our asphalt, all of which is specified for a range of temperatures. And when you get outside that range even a little bit, the engineers didn't plan for that extra few degrees, and the asphalt turns to goo. And so where we built the most sophisticated, the most technical, the most specific infrastructure, we're going to see the most cost. So I think it's hard, it's hard for us to understand, right, asphalt's melting. Well, we replace the roads, right? I mean, can you drill it down to give us some specifics as to sort of our numbers or dislo dislocation, what you expect in a city like Boston? So I think in a city like Boston, the the... The challenge is that it's kind of everywhere, and it's not always a catastrophe. So the sea seems the most ominous, right? It's going to come and sweep us away. But the rest of these things are all incremental. Oh, we just, everybody gets air conditioning. Oh, we keep repairing the roads. Oh, we, we slightly change other infrastructure. Oh, we get our plant, our food from somewhere else. 
but all of those things cumulatively impose a cost. The other is, and one of those costs for us is actually human health. And the people are, we find over and over again in the literature that are most at risk are the elderly, the sick, and children. Children have a really hard time offloading heat. And so we're going to have one of the places where we're really going to have to think about climate change more is schools. Fewer snow days, more heat days. What is the infrastructure of those schools? How do we think about maybe you shouldn't take a test after a hot night because we know kids' cognition goes down? It's a kind of awareness, this awareness of how the climate is changing and how we live in it. And so resiliency is part of just being more comfortable with the fact that we need to be more in tune with our physical world. And that's a cultural change I think everybody can make. So it sounds to me, because I know you sort of famously said that the terminal value of any Florida-based capital asset is zero. So Boston's not Florida, but it sounds to me like what you're saying is we need to make really big changes and we need to start making them now. That's right. And the second part of that is maybe not in Boston per se, but in greater Boston, over time we should expect the people who left to go to Florida for the low tax rates to come back. And that's a hard thing to plan for, to at once right now compete over taxes and other things, to have those people not leave. But in the other sense, be ready for them to come back because our climate will stay a very livable one and other places will stay, if not unlivable, uninvestable. And so there's this challenge of the short, medium and long term where the long term should be very, very good for the state in terms of migration, but hard infrastructure, agriculture, and even just culture-wise. So it's a, it's a challenge. I know that um, the climate chief of the state of Massachusetts is doing a great job, Melissa Hoffer, but it's a local issue in every town, and it's a civic issue everywhere. And if we can all become more aware, I think we can all do a better job of it. Spencer Glendon, thanks so much for being with us today. It was a treat. Thank you.